Hi everybody, welcome. Uh, firstly, my name is Tony Glenning and uh, despite any entrepreneurial experience I may have, I think the um, basis for my knowledge on this talk is from working at Starfish Ventures, which uh, is where I'm currently placed. And we see roughly 400 pitches a year. So I think definitely we've seen the full gamut um, from great to terrible and looking forward today to passing on hopefully some of those insights to you guys uh, for when you go out and you know need to pitch a business. Um, mostly pitching is asking for money, but uh, to be honest, you actually need to pitch a business to many different people uh, because uh, for employees, if you want to attract the best and brightest, then uh, as a startup, often your financial remuneration isn't going to be uh, top, um, you know, top dollar. And uh, one way to get around that's equity. And then you're going to need to convince that person that equity is going to be worth something. And you're going to need to sell them on your company. And that's also true for new customers um, and for perhaps advisors or anything. So pitching is definitely uh, a very important skill to have. Um, all that said, coming back um, to this talk, I will focus mainly on you know, kind of pitching for capital. Um, but many, if not all, of the um, same principles apply. So to get started, uh, in pitching, your mission is really just to present enough about your idea or company uh, to be interesting to the potential investor. Um, and uh, secondly, and, and this shouldn't need to be said, but your pitch really needs to fit within the time provided. And the time provided may be from the classic elevator pitch, which is where you've got basically got 30 seconds, to a standard you know, venture capital meeting, which would be an hour you know, from start to finish. So at the um, end of that time, um, your goal, um, despite what you might kind of go in thinking, is not actually to raise money, right? Because there's absolutely no chance you're going to get money after you know, speaking to someone for an hour. Really, what your goal is, is to get another meeting. And that's actually quite important because it, it really flows over to some of the um, things that you're going to put in and some of the things you're going to leave out to your pitch. Because really, that, you really want to keep that in mind, that you just want to be interesting enough that that person who you're pitching to can follow up with more information and you know, dig into your uh, venture. So for investors, um, really there's two kind of big topics that they're going to in be interested in in your pitch. One is about the problem, like what is it you're trying to solve, what's the business need, the size of that, who's, who's also trying to solve it. And the second um, element they're going to be interested in is obviously the solution. What's your product or service, the business model that you're using to sell it, and um, you know, the, the, the team that's going to deliver on that. So they're kind of the two big areas that you want to cover in your pitch. And what we want to really do is then weave a narrative around addressing those two things. I, I certainly don't recommend you, you know, just go through the points in that order. I could, and, and we'll get to a specifics uh, in just a minute. But you, what you'll see is that by the time we're done, Everything, hopefully, is really focused on answering those two uh, questions. So you definitely do want to create a narrative. Um, nothing's more boring for the listener than for you just to go through each of your points and start off with, you know, the, the team is this and the finances are that and the balance sheet is this and the P&L is that and so on. You really want to start with a story. Because remember, in this first meeting, um, and this is, uh, I should actually also say, primarily focused on a, on a first type meeting, um, you want to be interesting, right? Um, and around that, you really want each slide to have a single key message that it communicates. Now either you can outright state that message if it's an interesting message, 
or it's just something that you keep in mind when you're creating that slide. And when we go through the specifics, again in a minute, I've kind of put at the top of each slide in square brackets, you'll see kind of the key message that I think that slide should leave the um, listener uh, with. The next thing is that you don't need to present every last detail. Uh, and again, this really speaks to that goal of just trying to get another meeting. Um, you don't need to say everything because if you achieve your goal, you're going to meet with that person again and you can follow up on the details or they'll ask questions or you know, you'll begin a dialogue. So in your mind, you should really be thinking that all things going well, um, you're going to have plenty of opportunity to present your business or idea in its fullness. So what you just need to do is you know, get across enough that it you know, grabs their attention. And you also want to allow time for questions. So in a standard VC pitch, you've got that one hour. I would absolutely not plan on going any longer than 45 minutes. And there's no harm if you finish in 45 minutes, you hammer everything home, you know, it's, it's a great pitch and you finish early, the VCs will probably thank you. They've got plenty of stuff to do. But your absolute worst case scenario is to not get through your pitch, right? Because then um, two things happen. One is there's probably valuable stuff that you wanted to communicate uh, that's been left off the table. But secondly is you kind of look unprofessional. And it's, uh, you know, in that initial meeting, um, those, you know, the investor, all they've got to go on is the information that you give them and they're going to draw on all of the kind of markers that's available to them, right? Your confidence, your enthusiasm, um, you know, your sincerity, all those sorts of things. And it's kind of a bad sign if you can't get through what you said you were going to do. And people automatically assume, well, look, they knew they had an hour and they couldn't get that done. What, what is it going to come to when they're trying to you know, deliver a product? They'll say it'll take six months, it's probably going to take 12 months. You know, whether it's fair or not, it just creates a poor impression. So I you know, really can't highlight strongly enough um, you know, that you need to fit the um, presentation into the time allowed. And, you know, and then some boilerplate stuff where you want to keep slides clean, make them easy to read. Um, you definitely don't need to read from them. You, you know, you just want to talk to them. You can leave off the detail on, you can put details on a slide that you just skip over because you can assume that everyone can read, right? So, and as soon as you've put a slide up, you can pretty much assume that everyone's read it. Like I'm sure every one of you is going to have read my slides before I've even got out the first word of what's on them. And so just take them as read and kind of speak to the interesting points that you want to make on them. And then a couple of other things, um, it's a much better narrative and a much more interesting presentation if you use specifics to illustrate general points. And for example, um, if you were trying to, you know, if you're the inventor of like a tax program like TurboTax, something that helps you fill out your taxes, you don't just want to say, oh, every year millions of people spend hours trying to complete their tax returns. Um, because that's just kind of telling someone um, about the problem. What you want to start off with is to say something that's much more personal to you or that you've witnessed. For example, you know, last year I spent or I struggled to complete my tax return. It took me two hours to locate the receipts. It took me three hours to fill it out. What I really wanted was, and then it asked me all these crazy questions that I didn't need to know. You know, what I've developed here is a solution that, you know, helps me through it. And, and so if you start with a specific, it's then very easy to generalize where you say, I did this, I did that, and guess what? Millions of other people have this problem too. And it just is, and as I said, it's a tip. That doesn't have, have to do it, but it just makes a much more interesting kind of presentation. Also, um, as we go through this, I'm kind of going to spend equal weight on each of the elements of the pitch. But you should not, right? Definitely for whatever product or solution you're selling, there's going to be obvious parts to it, whether it's the problem is obvious or the market opportunity is obvious, um, and there's going to be subtlety around it. And sometimes that subtlety may be in the business model, and that's where you need to focus your attention. 
maybe two examples that come to mind would be is that if you had discovered cold fusion, right, and you could generate power super cheaply, you wouldn't spend a lot of time justifying the size of the power market, how much power households use, the amount of billions that could be, you know, saved. I think you can say, you can take that as a given. What someone's really going to be interested in is how did you do cold fusion, right? Like that's, you know, that's the interesting part, the non-obvious part. Um, and, and business models can be really interesting too. Many, um, certainly consumer or retail plays are all about the marketing. And it's the go-to market that really differentiate, um, differentiates you. So for example, um, I think one common one is around um, like some of the bottled water products, things like that. Like I certainly remember when bottled water first came out. I thought that's ridiculous. Like who would ever buy bottled water comes free from a tap. Um, but not only does one person do that, like you can buy about 20 different brands, you know, from smart water to this water to that water. And by and large, they're all the same, right? They absolutely are all the same. The only thing that's different about them is the packaging and the marketing. And that's okay, because they're really valuable businesses. And you know, if there are people that have the um, knowledge and wherewithal, the understanding to present this product in a new way that's compelling, nothing wrong with that as a business, but that's what you want to spend the time on. So getting down to specifics, um, you really want the pitch you know, to be as concise as possible. Uh, you want to have a cover slide, um, and you may or may not want to have an elevator pitch. We'll get to that in a bit more detail. You, you want to talk about the problem, you know, which is around that business need, the solution, which is your product or service, the market opportunity, the team, the competition, business model, you know, financial projections, the ask, which is usually capital, but it may be, as I hinted at earlier, other things like um, advisors or you know, trying to recruit an employee, come join us, that's what you're asking them, and then closing. And of those, there's really only about 10 kind of key slides, right? The, the cover slide and or elevator pitch, the others, and the closing side you're not going to speak to. And really, your pitch should be about, you know, in an hour, should literally be about that long. 10 to maybe 15 slides. And if, that, and if you have more slides than that, it's just going to take too long. So diving into the details. So on the cover slide, and this is what I said, so the square brackets up the top there, I'm saying this you know, is kind of what your purpose is. And the only purpose of this is just to create a positive initial impression, right? And in fact, as you walked in, I had my cover slide. I didn't really speak to it. Maybe the only thing you say is, you know, hi, I'm Tony, and you know, I'm here to speak to you, and then you move on. So not a lot of detail there. The only thing that may be there of significance is if you have um, kind of a tagline or um, like a really simple elevator pitch that, that suits your business, then I think it's fine to have that and to you know, kind of set the scene. Because one of the things is, um, let, let's take Starfish Ventures, you know, we invest in technology. And technology spans the range for us from life sciences, that's you know, drug discovery, to new medical devices, through to IT, which is hardware and software, software from enterprise to mobile, and we hear all these pitches. So when an entrepreneur walks in the room, I may have just come from you know, life sciences or something, and if they're gonna pitch me on you know, some mobile app, it's kind of helpful if in the first 30 seconds uh, after they've said who they are, they say, I'm here to tell you about such and such. And that just lets me you know, mentally prepare for what's coming next. So it doesn't take me three slides to kind of work out what it is that they're actually you know, pitching to me. So really, I'd just suggest with this, you know, it just sits on the screen, you, you say your name, whatever, and move on. So then the elevator pitch slide is kind of serving that purpose of you know, setting the scene. So if you didn't do that in the opening slide, and it's fine not to, because you want to have you know, a bit more of a pause around it, I think that's fine. And you just want to have you know, that pithy statement that says what your business does. And you know, often that can take the form of, you know, like Yammer is the Facebook for business. You know, hi, I'm here to talk about you know, Twitter for photos. 
something like that that just gets the sets the scene. Again, don't spend a lot of time on it. It's just meant to set the scene. And so you just kind of want to have the investor intrigued a little bit and ready to hear more. That's the goal. So with the problem slide, now this is probably the first slide where we're actually kind of getting into the meat and potatoes of the pitch. And really, the goal here is just to say that there's a compelling business need. In other words, businesses are spending a lot of time or spending a lot of money on doing something and you've got a better way of doing it. Um, and, you know, definitely you want to, um, again, uh, explain this. I think this is where the personal narrative works well, where you start off by explaining the problem from a specific, like either I had this problem or, you know, this guy Andrew did this, this and this, and then generalize. I think it's just a good way to present it. Um, and it also, I think, adds weight to something we're going to get to later, which is that you're the team to deliver on this solution or you're the person to deliver on this solution because it shows that you have a real understanding, a personal understanding of this problem and not just a theoretical that this might be an issue, that, that you really understand, you know, the pain points. And, you know, that problem can take a number of forms. I've listed a few here, but, um, you know, and, and some of the problems, as I've listed in bullet point number three, um, you know, the current solutions, you know, create another problem. For example, you know, with the rise of social media, you know, there's a product Hootsuite, and, and that only exists, I guess, because, you know, if you're using social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all these things, you know, to manage your social um, image as a company, then you have a problem of managing all these things now. That problem didn't, you know, meet, that, that problem didn't uh, um, exist until there was all these other solutions to another problem, which was to, you know, get more exposure for your brand. So, you know, these are evolving markets. So however you want to explain the problem, you definitely want to, you know, present it as, you know, this, um, you know, basically expensive in either time or money issue for a business. And definitely that there's a big opportunity there. So then the next thing you want to get into is what your solution is. And here the takeaway that you want the listener or the investor to have is that your product or service, you know, really solves that problem. You have invented a better mousetrap. And you definitely want to again show or, um, you know, demonstrate that, that solution, not just say, and we have solved that problem. You can lead in with that, but then go on and, you know, and it's just a difference in language where it's rather than say, um, you know, and we have a new software product that will let you fill your tax forms out five times faster because of these reasons. You just want to say, here, let me show you in our solution, um, you know, the user starts by entering this information and you maybe have a demo uh, and the, you know, the program then cleverly switches to ask follow-on questions dependent on the, you know, answers to the first questions. And to the extent you can demonstrate how much um, better your product or solution is than the problem you've described, you know, the, the, the better it is for you. So after you've kind of said, here's the problem and we have a solution, the next thing you want to communicate is that there are lots of people or businesses, you know, that have this problem. In other words, there's a real market opportunity here. And, you know, in defining the market, um, there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, um, you can use kind of a top-down approach, which is you say the you know, billions of dollars are spent on you know, enterprise, what have you, software every year. We intend to get you know, some percentage of that. Um, or you can use a bottom-up approach, which is uh, you know, we're selling to small to medium businesses who work in accounting and there are 10,000 firms in the US and, you know, or 100,000 firms in the US, 10,000 in Australia, and build your market up that way, kind of a bottom up. My personal preference is to use a bottom up approach. I think that has a lot more credibility and people can get their head around the numbers um, that it's gonna be a big opportunity much better. Because if you say there's 10,000 um, 
you know, small businesses, if we sell to, you know, 1,000 of them, we can be really successful. That sounds, I think, much more believable because it, it says that, um, you know, it kind of implies that you actually understand the go-to-market, that this is how many you need to reach, hopefully you've got some thoughts around how you're going to reach them, and, you know, it just makes a much more credible pitch. If you start off with the billions of dollars type approach and kind of say, oh, and we only need to get, you know, 1% or 0.1% of this and we're really successful, like, it's just too, for me anyway, ephemeral, right? Like, who's to say you're even going to get that? Who's to say you're going to get more or less? Um, there's also a couple of classic mistakes with the um, top-down approach, is that people define their market, um, you know, for example, we stick, go back to that um, tax software. If you were trying to sell, you know, personal tax software, I'd say it's no, you know, you don't want to start off by saying consumers spend $5 billion on, you know, software each year. And therefore, you know, we're going to be really successful. Because the question is, how much are they going to spend on tax software, not just software in general? So it's the addressable market that's really important. And top down, often, um, you know, trying to get to the addressable market is difficult and many people in their effort to put in their billion dollar numbers just use a category that's so broad it's meaningless. And I would, you know, and I think the way I, you know, most like to see it and would suggest to you as a, as a first cut is do the bottom up approach uh, to kind of, you know, show how you get the specifics and then use a top down to um, kind of sanity check those numbers. So that you say, you know, there's, if there's 10,000 people you want to do and to tell this to, and that's, you know, so that's going to generate revenue of, you know, whatever it is, $10 million. Um, and then say, but, you know, and we can see this is reasonable because the total amount spent in, on consumer software products is a billion dollars, and, and this is a small fraction of that. So, you know, it just, you can use it to sanity check, but I wouldn't lead with that. So I think the next thing after you've kind of touched on um, those first three topics is the team. And you really just want to um, leave the, the investor uh, with the comfort that you are the right team. You know, like there's a question of why are you? And, and, and I think the initial part of that is why use because you've developed the solution, right? Like, um, so so that, that gives you a tick. If, if the solution that you've just presented makes sense, solves the problem, you know, I'd say the listener is already favorably disposed to you. But there's a couple of other elements they probably want to tick off um, as well. I, you know, one would be that you have personal experience in the space. Like, I think that's a big plus. Uh, two would be, you know, that you've experience in running or operating, um, you know, a startup company and or experience in you know delivering software or whatever hardware whatever your solution is in in the way in which you're going to do it and also that you actually have team a team around you that has the skills necessary you know and that's um you know from sales to marketing to engineering um you know to pr whatever it is that you're going to need now in the event that you don't have the full team it's okay to mention that here, and maybe that's part of the ask later on, where, you know, I think the first best thing is if, is if a team who pitches to me, you know, has all the elements they need to be successful. The second best thing is that they don't have all the elements, but they know what they're missing. And third or worst is where they don't have all the elements, but they don't know that. And, you know, they've got no plans to address it, because that generally looks like you know, they're inexperienced and on a path to failure. So there's no shame in, you know, saying what, what you don't, is owning up to knowing what you don't know. You know, I think that's fine. Of course, if you don't know too much stuff, well then the investor may say, go away, do some more work and come back when you've solved it. But it, it's unlikely they'll just slam the door in your face, you know, kind of thing, cut you off. Because at least, you know, you're wise enough to, to know that, you know, if you tick these boxes, you might have something. Um, the next topic that really needs to address, so 
for, for every, you know, um, problem or, and, and every solution or everything you're delivering, there's always some alternative. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, the world was turning before you came onto it. It'll still be turning after you've left it. So people are getting by, getting on with their lives, right? So whenever someone says, you know, there's no actual competitor to, to what we're doing, like, that's fine. But what they're really saying is perhaps there's no direct competitor. But there's always an alternative or a substitute or the way that people used to work. And you definitely want to highlight your, you know, differentiation from what people used to do or how they used to solve the problem with how you're proposing that they do it. And clearly you want to demonstrate that, you know, you're not just a little bit better, you're a ton better because it's really hard to sell something that's only 10 or 20 percent better. You know, even twice as good, um, you know, is, has a threshold because people are lazy. They, they, you know, they don't want to take a risk on a small startup. They've got the way they already do things. So unless you're going to deliver to them a compelling advantage, it's going to be a hard sell. And so you really want to present yourself against the competitors as having that you know, compelling advantage. Um, and there's a number of ways to do that. Dep and this uh, definitely um, depends on your business and how it's positioned. But the whole point is about, you know, you need to differentiate yourself. And probably the most common way is um, that kind of that four quadrant, uh, Gartner, you know, magic quadrant they kind of do, chart that I've got there top right, which is where you have two arbitrarily defined axes that are carefully chosen, that whatever differentiators you need, you're top and right. And, and that's kind of where you want to be. Um, not every business or every opportunity, you know, kind of makes sense to be expressed like that. So if you're in the space where you're kind of bringing together different things, then maybe that chart on the left is more you, where you say, look, there are companies that do this and companies to do that and the third that do this, and it's a nightmare dealing with all three of them. We bring it all together and make it easy to use, you know, in one-stop shopping or something. And, you know, in which case, you know, if you're the intersection of a number of different solutions, then maybe that you know competitive chart on the left looks better. And then probably the tried and true one is also down the bottom right there, which is just the feature comparison list. The, the, all of these to some extent are artificial, right? Because you choose as the um, presenter which factors you're going to put in and which ones you leave out. So it's almost always possible to present yourself as um, you know, top right in a Gartner chart, just got to pick the axes right, uh, you know, or ticking all the boxes. If you just leave off every box that you don't do that your competitor does and add in every box that you do do that they don't, then hey, you've got a list of ticks and they don't. So, you know, you can do that. The, the, the trick here is to be, you know, hopefully as upfront and um, honest as possible to, and where you really are differentiated. You know, because at the end of the day, if the business isn't, you know, it doesn't differentiate itself to its target market, then, you know, it's not going to be successful. And so I would encourage you, you know, to try and be as even handed with this. And, and really, maybe that also speaks to, um, you know, your addressable market, which you'll have covered in the last slide, is that maybe, you know, the incumbents have um, more features than you do. But those features serve a different target market. And therefore, the fact that you don't have them is not relevant to you or not relevant to your market. Uh, but the features that you do have that they don't is what's going to differentiate you. And that's OK. And in fact, even better than that, you know, it demonstrates really good market understanding. So you know, that's, and in every presentation, I definitely think you need to say something around competition. Even, you know, where, where if you invented the car and there were no cars before, you know, doing the Model T Ford or whatever it is, then, you know, the competition was the horse, right? Like, it's just the way people used to do it. Or the washing machine, it was hand washing. I don't know. Like, there really isn't anything that, you know, there's the way people currently get that job done, more or less. Even, you know, social media was, you know, that's just marketing. People used to market like this. 
now there's a way to do this. Or people keep in touch with friends writing letters or email, now there's a better way. So, and I stress this because, you know, many pitches really don't do a good job on that competitor analysis. And usually that's going to be a pretty detailed topic, but I then, you know, so you just want to differentiate it and open the door to more questions. You don't need to go through every last detail. So, kind of to recap, we've kind of said that, um, you know, businesses have this problem, you've got a solution. There's a lot of people with this problem. There aren't people that currently address that problem. How are you going to make money? So that's what this, so the business model is about exactly that. That you can make money serving those customers with your solution. And there's so many different ways you can make money, you know, from licensing to, you know, freemium, you know, whether there's perpetual or SaaS and all this stuff. And depending on your product, you know, it could be a razor blade model or whatever it is where, you know, low onboarding, but, you know, get them on the refills. Whatever it is, that's just what we're going to explain here that says, you know, this is how we're going to make money. That's what your business model is. And certainly it's, um, you know, from time to time you have uh, companies that actually have no business model whatsoever, right? And, um, you know, certainly some of them have been pretty popular in the media of late. Um, you know, I think Instagram had no business model, sold for a billion. Um, actually, WhatsApp did have a business model, possibly wouldn't make it a lot of money, but, you know, it nevertheless had one. Um, so, but I would certainly encourage you to at least have, even if you don't have an initial one, um, you need to have some thoughts around, I guess, the currency that you're going to try to achieve. And if that currency isn't dollars, maybe it's users. But I think between the two, it's, it's got to be one of those two. And then, you know, because if your pitch is that I'll do this thing, I'll get a ton of users and I'm going to monetize later, I think that is somewhat believable these days. But you definitely want to have some thoughts around how you're going to monetize them. Is it through ads or at least this notion of, look, it's clear that we could monetize them through, you know, one of these three means. We haven't picked what it is. But you definitely want to have some notion around, you know, how you're going to make money. And that really leads into the next slide is that you're not just going to make money, you're going to make lots of money. So your financial projections, you want to have, you know, at least five years as a startup and maybe three years for a more established company. But at the end of the day, you need to demonstrate to the investor that um, this business is going to make, you know, the sorts of money that's going to interest them. So for a venture capital firm, uh, for us, you know, we really want to see that this business is going to be worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in the future. There are plenty of good businesses that aren't going to be like that. And that's fine, but they're probably not for venture capital. So for whoever you're pitching to, um, you know, you just need to make sure that whatever projections you're going to show in front of them, you know, is going to fit their mandate and be of interest to them. And, and, and at some level, it's okay if it's not. It just means you've picked the wrong person, and they'll probably tell you pretty quickly. So, and as I said, there are lifestyle businesses and, and all different sorts of businesses that are really good. Uh, but just not maybe not suited for a specific investor. So, um, and generally with, with the projections, you want to keep them pretty high level financials. You know, revenue, expenses, EBITDA, margin, that, that's probably the minimum. And that's fine if you, know, if you just have that. It's fine to add in a few key other metrics like users or some other metric if that's, you know, really important to your business. Uh, number of units sold or something like that. So, um, you know, you'll need to pick if there's any other key things that you want to highlight, but um, I'd certainly encourage keeping it, you know, pretty high level. Because for um, an investor, certainly for, I'd say, myself or at Starfish Ventures, when I look at this slide, I'm not really going into the details because presumably there's a whole model behind this. All I want to do is check the box that this business is going to, is potentially, or at least the entrepreneur is thinking, that it's going to make the sort of money that's of interest to us. 
And certainly we've had pitches where people say, oh, look, you know, you give us $2 million and, you know, in five years' time, we'll have $500,000 worth of revenue. And you go, well, there's no point in that. So, you know, so I'm just trying to mentally check the box and you want to do the same. The numbers have to be believable. Like, you, you need to do the work behind it. And I'll probably dig into it later. But in this first pitch, in the first meeting, I just want to tick the box that says, yep, they're thinking that they can make lots of money. So when we've got through that, you've really addressed those two big questions that I started out saying. You've kind of said, here's the problem with its various facets. Here's a solution with various facets. And now you really just say, the only thing you know, required to make this happen is five million bucks or you know, your advice or you to join the company or whatever it is you're, you know, you're trying to pitch to get on that day. But you know, assuming it's money, you want to finish up with how much money you're trying to raise. I think further detail is optional. I'd only put this in if um, you actually kind of have a term sheet and maybe you know, you're trying to get other investors. You've already got a couple of angel investors who have agreed to terms and now, or they've set the terms and now you're trying to get other people on board, then you may as well tell those other people up front, you know, kind of what the terms are. They're investing, you know, in a convertible note or pre-money of this or whatever it is. Um, but in terms of, if this is your initial pitch to a, to a VC and you, you don't have a term sheet, there's no point, or well not no point, you don't really need to go into these details because they're out of your control largely. Like, depending on, well, that's more like a negotiation that's going to come later on. And, you know, the VC may ask you, and that's fine, and, and you should be prepared with an answer about what the pre-money is or how you're going to value your business in its current state. But at the end of the day, you know, I guess value is in the eye of the purchase. So it's but they're going to have form their own view on, on, on the value and you putting a huge number up there is probably going to be more of a turn off than a turn on. So, you know, I think feel free to, to, to leave those details off. Certainly, another thing, you know, if there's any information on prior investment rounds, again, I think that's if that's uniquely interesting, I might put it up there. But, you know, if you've raised money in the past, maybe just have that as some total figure, something like that but I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it. Also, use of proceeds, I think that's not a bad, you know, we're raising $5 million and the rough breakdown, a million for marketing, two million on staff, you know, on R&D or, you know, factory prototypes or whatever it is, just to give a flavor. But at some level, um, you've already, with the financial projections, probably already hinted at that because you know presumably the EBITDA the difference between your revenue and your expenses is going to be this negative number and the sum of all those negative numbers is probably going to be how much you need to get this business going not necessarily because you may you know plan on raising capital in a number of tranches and maybe the business needs 10 million dollars you know over the five years but in the initial lot it just needs you know one to three million to prove out these three things and maybe that's what you put here. I need this much money to do these things to show these results. Like, and that's kind of how you want to leave it. So really, that's the presentation in a nutshell, as it, you know, according to Tony. Um, you know, you then have a closing slide that you're not really going to speak to at all and it's really just to say, you know, do you have any questions? And at the end of the questions, you really want to ask, like, what's the next step in the process? And that's just going to, and usually for um, a VC, they'll say, oh, well, I'll say, no thanks right there, that's unlikely. Normally they say, we'll think about it and get back to you. And you just want to get a timeline on that. And just be nice and, and don't badger them. But the whole point is, you want to know when you can then ask them, and, and they'll probably say, oh, I'll get back to you, you know, next week. And, and, and that's all you need to know. You go, thanks, that's great. Uh, because then the week after that, you can email them and say, hey, just wondering, you know, have you had a chance to talk about this amongst the partnership? So you know when you can follow up without badgering. And, and, and that's a perfectly reasonable thing to ask. And it's perfectly reasonable to follow up if the VC didn't do what they said they were going to do, which is get back to you within a week. 
So, and that's really you just want to understand what those next steps are. I think in a presentation you can definitely have um, appendix slides. I think really the appendix slides, um, you know, which by far and away most people don't get to, and I think that's because they don't use them well. And really, you want appendix slides, I think, for two reasons, right? One is where, for whatever it is that you're pitching, whatever the least obvious part of the plan is, um, you know, you want to may go into more detail um, if someone asks you about it. And that way, you know, and there's nothing wrong with whetting the appetite where you kind of just touch on someone, give a flavor, get them intrigued, and then move on. And that way, have them come back to you. And if you pitch, you know, you've got it, maybe it's 30 minutes, because you just know they're going to ask questions. Or maybe you try out a few, and, you know, where people ask questions, you have a little bit of a teaser. And then you're ready to, you know, bang this really good answer out. But the advantage of having it in the appendix is that if people aren't interested, you don't waste their time or your time. And also, for something complicated or detailed, um, it's much easier, I think, to present that to someone who specifically asked about it than for when you're up there just, you know, rabbiting on and then you need to dive into this detail and so on. So it, it kind of gives you, I think, a bit more permission to dive into details if they've asked about it. Also, you may want to have um, additional or appendix slides, you know, for the least credible parts of the pitch. So for the thing that you think is really what you've innovated on or is going to be, you know, the most incredible part of the business that hopefully you've solved and you've got a really good answer for, then, you know, back it up. And, you know, there's some things, you know, whether it's you go to market, market dynamics, maybe there's something really interesting that's just happened, which makes it so that, um, you know, here and now is the right time for this business. And, you know, you can go into a bit more detail around that. Exit strategy, I think, is probably the least useful one. I almost put that up there just to rubbish it. But, uh, like, because, you know, my view is, and, and others do have a different view on this, is that um, build a good business, right? Like, if you just build a business that makes a lot of money, then the exit will look after itself. Most, most businesses exit through trade sales um, and, uh, um, you know, because a bigger company buys you. Uh, a, a minority will go onto an IPO. Between those two, um, it's not immediately obvious which one I would say. It, often it's not immediately obvious. Some businesses are just fundamentally unsuitable for an IPO and therefore it's a trade sale. But I wouldn't really go into that unless that is the least credible part of your pitch, right? Like if for some reason it's not immediately obvious, like okay, so you do all this and you get all these users and maybe, you know, you don't have an obvious business model. It's like, and then in three years, you know, like YouTube, let's say that, like there's a great example. Like they were burning through money, like there's no tomorrow, kind of reminds me of Box now. But, um, but they were burning through money like there was no tomorrow. They had absolutely no plans to make money. And if they didn't get acquired or raise more, bit, or raise more capital, like they were literally going to be out of business, you know, within months. Um, and so if you are pitching to someone, you know, like, hey, you need to give us money, then that's a case where I'd say, yeah, you'd really want to maybe touch on the exit strategy that, oh, yeah, look, this is desperately needed by these companies have already approached us. Maybe we see this money to stay afloat for another year. We'll get that. All right, so that kind of finishes my uh, talk. hope that was helpful. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, tomorrow night's our public forum, second public forum on technology, uh, technology and innovation. Um, register on Eventbrite. Thanks.